Hey, it's Art from My New Microphone. Welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I want to share with you my five-step mixing workflow that I use in my own mixes to give you some ideas or maybe some general direction to help you get better results in your mixes. So quickly, my five-step workflow includes one, mix preparation, two, getting the initial balance primarily with faders and pan pots, three, the bulk of the processing and refining such processing, four, automation and any additional production effects that we'd like to use, and five, mix finalization. Now to keep this video at a digestible length for YouTube, I'm not going to go super deep into each of these steps. However, I do go deep into these steps in my free mix and guidebook. You can pick that up in the first link in the description box down below. It's an in-depth PDF that will cover what we talk about in this video and much more. So you can use it as a sort of study aid to come back to this video or as a standalone PDF if you're interested. So I could do this video sitting virtually face to face with you and just discuss my workflow, or I could show it to you inside my DAW. I think that that's the better option. So let's hop into Logic Pro. All right, here we are inside of Logic Pro. The song that we will be working on today is one of my own. It's called To the Moon and Back. This is off of my album Memes and Dreams. I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below if you are interested in listening to that on whatever streaming service you prefer. But let's start with mix preparation, the first step in my mixing workflow. So you'll see here that I have all of my drums set up first. Then in this case, my percussion, these are samples. These are drums that I produced inside of Superior Drummer 3 by TuneTrack, but it would be similar had I recorded acoustic drums with real microphones. Here we have, again, the percussion. These are samples. I believe they are exclusively from Splice. After that, I have the bass, including the bass synth right here. Then I have my e-piano, then I have synths, then I have guitars right here. So depending on the mix or the project, I will have these instruments ordered in a different way, but I will typically always have my drums first, followed by any percussion, followed by my bass, and then my instruments here. In this case, there are no vocals in this song, but I would have usually the vocals last. And then right here, you see that I have my effects returns right here. So that is how I set up my session in terms of track order. Now, if we go to the routing here, I usually always set up the same way where I have my tracks in order going to bus one. In this case, the drums going to bus one. And if I bring this mixer up, you see that my drum bus or my drum subgroup right here has the input as bus one. The percussion, all of the percussion tracks are being outputted to bus two. Bus two is the input for the percussion bus. In this case, bus three has all of the bases being routed to it, and then it has the input on bus three. The e-piano, even though there's only one track, is being sent to its own bus for the e-piano. Same thing goes for the synth right here. Let me turn off that input where the synth is being outputted to bus five, and then this synth bus or subgroup has its input as bus five. Then I have the guitars right here, which are all being routed to bus six, and the guitars subgroup right here has the input as bus six. Additionally, I have some VCAs. So this first guitar VCA is controlling these tracks right here, and then I'll typically have a VCA to control the snares and the kicks. In this case, I think I need to add that one there. I think it must have been disabled somehow. So some VCAs right here to control the levels of the tracks that are being sent to them without having to mess about with the relative levels of the faders of those tracks. So usually if I have two or more tracks that I want control over with a single fader, I will use a VCA or in some cases when I can route them to their own bus or subgroup, I will do it that way, but in this case, the kicks and the snares are all being routed to the drum bus right here on bus one. So I wanted a VCA in addition to the control that I have over the bus. You may notice here that each of these subgroups is being routed to bus 33. And if we come over here, bus 33 is the mix bus right here. Now, normally when I'm mixing by myself and I'm not having to speak through Logic, I will just have this set as my stereo out. However, in the case where I am teaching, I will typically have my voice coming in with input one through my interface being sent to the stereo out, as well as the mix bus being sent to the stereo out so that I can have different processing on my voice versus the mix bus here. So that is just an additional aside that doesn't necessarily have to do with my workflow. Moving on, you see that everything is color coordinated. So for example, all of the guitars are light blue, the synths are pink, the e-piano is orange, the bass is purple, perks are deeper orange, and then the drums are red. 
this is the typical color scheme that I will go with so that regardless of whatever mix I am working on, I can quickly identify what's what in my session. So you absolutely do not have to copy the ordering of my tracks or the color coding that I use, but I would highly encourage you to have something of your own that you can rely on mix after mix to make things that much easier for you once you hop into a mix that maybe you haven't gotten to in a while or any new mixes that you are starting. So beyond that, I will typically go and look for any phase issues after this as part of my mix preparation. So if we go up here to the kicks, we can zoom in here. So if we look at these kick drums, for example, we have a kick sample right here and then the kick in from Superior Drummer 3. And we see that after the initial transient, that these are fairly out of phase. So when in this instance, the sample is at a positive amplitude, the kick in is at a negative amplitude. And then right here, the kick in goes positive while the kick sample goes negative. And so what did I do here in the mix? I have the phase inverted on the kick drum right here, and I don't have it inverted there. There's also a phase flip option right here in the E channel, but neither of those have been toggled. So in this case, the phase has been inverted on this kick right here, the kick sample, and not on the kick in. So that will effectively turn this positive amplitude into a negative one so that it's better in phase with this. And then, of course, this negative amplitude will now be positive, so it will better match the kick in right here. And the kick in should be relatively in phase with the rest of the tracks from Superior Drummer 3. It does a pretty good job of phase aligning everything like that. So technically phase invert is incorrect. It's really polarity invert, but I will digress on that point. I could go on and on about the differences between the two, but I will save it for another video. After I take care of the phase, I like to go through and gain stage each of my tracks. So you'll notice that on each of these tracks in the mixer, the first or second in the case of the bass plugin is a gain plugin and if i open any of these you'll see that i am applying varying amounts of gain to these different tracks right here so the gain staging is effectively when i have these faders at unity i want roughly the same level at each track typically between about negative 24 to negative 18 dbfs in the case of digital audio and what this does is it helps me maintain headroom throughout the entirety of the mix, not only on the individual tracks, but on their subgroups and ultimately on the mix bus. It helps in the cases of some analog emulation plugins to drive them with an appropriate level and not to distort them too much. And to me personally, the best thing about gain staging is that it gives me relative levels at specific fader positions. And so I no longer have instances where, for example, I could have these two hats and for these two hats to be at the same level without gain staging, I might need one to be at positive six and the other to be at negative 22. That really doesn't jive well with me. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But with gain staging, if they are both at the same level at unity, then I can be sure that at negative six, let's say, they will also be at the same perceived level there. So that's just a little something extra that I find to be the biggest benefit of gain staging. I have a video on gain staging. I will put a link to that in the description box down below if you'd like to check that one out. So that is also part of my mix preparation. And in this case, I produced the song. And so you see that I'm not dealing specifically with multi-tracks, but I would do some cleanup of the multi-tracks if I was mixing a track for somebody else. In this case, I made sure to clean everything up, whether in the samples here or in the recorded stuff that I have here. Also, because this is one of my own productions, I bounced out any MIDI tracks that I had to audio. It's always important to mix your audio rather than your MIDI. MIDI can mistrigger, and it also just puts more strain on the processing power of your computer. In my case, I'm still using my 2015 iMac, and so I need all of the processing power that I can get. I will eventually get that Mac Studio once my budget allows. So another thing I like to do in mix preparation is set up what I believe my effects returns ought to be. So I will often use drum parallel compression. I will often use a snare plate. I'll often set up some sort of long plate depending on what kind of mix I'm doing. When I have guitars, I like using opposite side or same side delay or reverb. In this case, we have a spring reverb right here on the right hand side and the left hand side. 
And then I will often also have a stereo delay as well as a mono delay just to be able to quickly send tracks and subgroups to these effects returns without having to set them up when I'm in the process of actually mixing. I don't want to be taken out of the zone, so to speak, by having to set up my effects returns when I'm in the bulk of the mix. And so I like to set up what I believe I will need before I actually start mixing in terms of effects returns right here. So once again, drum parallel compression, snare plate, long plate, guitar verb L, guitar verb R, stereo delay, and mono delay in the case of this mix. So I could go on for hours about mix preparation, but I think that that's sufficient for this video. Let's quickly move on to the initial balance. Now the initial balance comes before I do any of my processing. So in this case, the e-channel strip that I have across many of these tracks right here has no effect on it. I'll often have it bypassed as well as all of these other inserts and as well as all of these sends to my effects returns. So I'm basically starting from scratch and what I will do here in the initial balance is I will bring the faders of all of my individual tracks down. I will start at the kick, bring the kick up, then bring the kick in up, and then balance my snare top and snare bottom to the kicks and move forward and get a strong drum mix. And then I will go through with all of these faders again down to negative infinity or faders all the way down. And then I will bring up the bass to mix the bass along with the drums. Then I'll move on in this case to the E piano. Then I'll bring up the synth. Then I'll bring up the guitars. And then finally the vocals, in this case there's no vocals in this track, but I will usually bring the vocals to sit them on top of the mix in the initial balance when there are vocals present. So that is the basics of the initial mix. And while I do try to do it in order of drums, the bass, and then the instruments, and finally the vocals, I will often have to backtrack and make minute adjustments to try to get that initial balance set. Now, when I start the initial balance, I will typically start it at the climax of the song. In this case, it would be the last measure right here from 49 to 65. And this is typically because most often there will be the most different tracks being active in the climax of the song. You can see here that it's pretty much a two part song. And so there are certain instruments that are happening in the second half of the first half and then another set of instruments that are going on in the second half of the second half of the track. And so I would mix this section to the best of my abilities to get that initial mix. And then with those faders set up, I would then move on to this section and mix whatever I couldn't mix in this section along to whatever I had there. Of course, it's not going to be perfect. Music is an evolving art form over time. It's literally sound changing over time. And so it's important not to stress too much about getting the balance right in every different section. It's more important to get a nice initial mix often at the climax again of the song and then to worry about adjusting things later on in the mix when it comes time for processing and especially with automation. And so I would go through again and just get my faders set up and my pan pot set up. In this case, I went for more of a LCR type mix, although you can see here that the hi-hats are panned just slightly off center. The percussion elements right here, because they are samples, I wanted them panned kind of around the stereo panorama, mostly to the right hand side. And then you see here in the guitars, I'm actually using true LCR panning where I have the guitars either panned hard left, hard right, or directly down the center. And what I like to do is periodically as I'm getting the initial mix on the mix bus, I will actually bring in a EQ that cuts out the low end and the high end so that I focus primarily on the mid range. And this helps to emulate poor playback systems to make sure that my kick drum is at an appropriate level to be heard in the mid range and that things are relatively balanced in that mid range because even the crappiest speakers will be able to produce mid range pretty accurately. Although the high end and the low end, while very important, are a little bit more tricky to get in terms of mix translatability. So if we can get things sounding good, especially in the initial balance in the mid range, then we can move forward with that much more confidence that our mix will translate to different systems. In addition to that, I also like to collapse periodically my mix to mono. So you see here that I have another gain plugin. This is a stereo version of Logic's stock gain plugin, but you could use any plugin on your DAW that allows you to collapse the stereo image into mono. You see that I have the mono toggled on there. And so I can just toggle this plugin on and off to go from stereo to mono. And I like to do that again, just for mixed translatability purposes, especially once I get to panning my different instruments around the stereo panorama. And oftentimes I will even go as far as panning my tracks 
while I am referencing in mono, just to make sure that I have them at an appropriate level if the track is summed into mono. And then when I come out of mono, it'll be that much wider and that much more well represented in the mix, these left and right elements that I have. So mix translatability is important, and it's important for us to think of it as soon as possible in the mix. So that's why I will often go through and do some of these techniques while I am going through the initial mix. I have a video on mix translatability. I will leave a link to that in the description box down below as well. So once we go through the climax of the song, the, in this case, other climax of the first half of the song, we should have pretty much everything balanced in a initial or rough mix. And then it comes time for processing. So you see here that I have this Waves SSL E channel strip on pretty much every one of my tracks. This offers us filters or EQ on the left hand side, dynamics or compression and expansion on the right hand side. And so what I like to do is start with EQ and compression and go through each of my tracks and EQ them appropriately. In this case, the kick drum sample, I have processed pretty aggressively. You see that I'm boosting nearly 15 dB at 8K. I'm cutting about 9 dB at 780 Hertz, about 12 dB at 260 Hertz. I'm boosting quite a bit of that low end. So perhaps I could have picked a better kick sample in this case, but I digress on that point. I will go through and start again with the first tracks in the order that I have them set up and do a bit of EQ, a bit of compression to get them sitting that much better in the mix. With the EQ here, you see that I have roughly the same processing on the kick end, so I'm processing these very aggressively. I normally wouldn't do this much, but perhaps in the context of this mix, this is what I needed to do. But yeah, I would go in again in order and set up my EQ and compression. I would pay special attention to the high pass filtering where we will roll off frequencies below this frequency right here. In this case, it's a 40. So we are gently rolling off frequencies below 40 dB. If we go to the snare here, relatively aggressive processing again here, perhaps not as aggressive as the kick drum, but you see here that we are high passing at 162. So again, a gentle roll off with everything below 162. And then in addition to the high pass filtering, I will also focus on some instruments on the low pass filtering. So in this case, the kick drum, I am low passing at about 10K. So while I do have a rather aggressive boost here at 8K, I am rolling off at about 10K. So that is going to curb some of what's going on here at the 8K shelving boost right here. That is at about 15 dB. So I would go through and do some EQ, often some compression at the same time. Now with the channel strip, I'll often only touch it a little bit with compression. We can have a look here at, let's say the snare. So in the case of the snare top, I'm only getting about 3 dB of gain reduction on the initial hit. You see here that I do not have fast attack. I have the slow attack setting on. So that allows that initial transient to poke through a little bit. Then I have a relatively fast release so that the compressor will disengage quickly after that initial transient dies off. So like mix preparation, I could go on for hours and hours about EQ and compression. But I just want to tell you that once I'm done the initial mix, EQ and compression are the first things that I focus on when it comes to processing the tracks within the mix. And so if we go through, we might see some more compression going on. For example, right here in the drum room, I have some compression happening in the E channel, but then I also have a stereo version of the CLA 76 that is just adding more compression to this room mic right here for the drums. <laughs> So just to crush it a little bit, get it more aggressive in the mix. If you couldn't tell just by looking at the processing, I wanted a more aggressive sounding drum sound on this mix. And so that's partly what this compression is for here. And we can go through, you can see that I'm not only using the SSL E channel for EQ. I often use the stock channel EQ right here. In this case, I am high passing the China sample. If we go through some more, you can see that I am using 
in the guitars, a little bit of compression with the 76, and then some more EQ in the case of the E-channel, but no compression. You see that the ratio is set here at a one-to-one. -one. So again, I'm not gonna go into extreme detail about all of my EQ and compression moves in this mix. I just wanna show you that after the initial mix, we get into the processing, and EQ and compression are the first things that I reach for in that. In addition to compression, I also like to use limiting in some instances. In this case, the bass subgroup, I am limiting somewhat. Just barely touching it there, maybe a dB or two of attenuation at the very peaks. But that is just to keep that bass at a more consistent level throughout the entirety of the mix, especially where we are going from one section to the next. I like to keep the bass relatively at the same level. I think it's important to keep a consistent bass because in less than ideal listening environments or even in ideal environments, having inconsistent bass can really throw off the entirety of the mix when certain notes will be that much louder than the rest of them. It's just not really a game I like playing. And so I like to limit my bass in this case. I have three different bass tracks, including the bass synth, and so I want it to limit the subgroup rather than each individual track right here, just to make sure, again, that the bass is consistent throughout. Limiting, in case you are unfamiliar, is essentially very hard compression with a ratio of infinity to one, so brick wall limiting is what I'm speaking about here, like the L1 limiter will not allow the audio signal level to surpass, in this case, the negative 15.9 set level, whereas a compressor, if it was set at this negative 15.9, would allow signal to surpass that level. However, it would clamp down and attenuate based on the ratio. I have tons of videos on compression as well. I'll leave links to in the description box. So beyond limiting compression and EQ, I like to use a lot of saturation in my mixes, particularly because we are working in digital audio workstations and digital audio can sometimes be a bit sterile. A little bit of saturation can go a long way to make things a little bit distorted, a little bit more characterful in the mix. And in the case of bass instruments like the bass and the kick drum, I like using saturation to bring out a little bit more presence in that mid range. So what saturation does is it effectively creates new harmonics in a signal based on the existing frequency content of that signal. And so when we have instruments like kick drums or bass guitars or bass synths that have a lot of energy in the low end, a bit of saturation can take that low end energy and make harmonics in the mid range that will act to improve the presence of that instrument, especially in the case where we are listening on less than ideal systems, and also because our ears are naturally more sensitive to the mid-range than they are to the low end. So in the case of the bass right here, I have the Saturn II by FabFilter. This is my go-to saturation plugin. I have it on the warm tape mode and a drive of 75%. But if we go through and have a look at a few different tracks, you see here the kick drums. I also have Saturn on as well. The snare top also has Saturn, as well as a clipping plugin. Now, clipping is often looked at in a negative light in digital audio. However, I like using clipping as a way to give myself a little bit more headroom in the mix. Of course, I'm not going to over clip and really distort and crush my signals, but I do like a little bit of soft clipping, particularly on transient information. It doesn't affect the sound in this case of the snare all that much, but it will again give me a bit more headroom so I can push the mix a little bit louder when it comes to mix bus compression and ultimately to mastering. So clipping is sort of like dynamic control. It's sort of like distortion. I just wanted to touch on it briefly here. I do have a video dedicated to clipping and limiting. I'll leave a link to that one in the description box as well. There's gonna be a whole bunch of videos there that you can check out for more information on what I'm just touching on in this video. But in addition to those basics, the EQ compression, saturation, and similar processing, I also have delay and reverb that I like to use. So delays and reverbs, I will typically have set up here on my effects returns. So we see here, I have a snare plate reverb, long plate, guitar reverbs, my stereo delay and my mono delay. And I'm effectively just sending what I believe to be necessary to those effects returns. I will typically not put delays and reverbs on individual tracks. I have a lot more independent control by having effects returns, and I can also send multiple tracks to a single effects return rather than having to insert the same exact plugin on multiple tracks. So that is a little bit more about routing, but I find, again, that having dedicated effects returns and independent control over our reverbs and delays gives us that much more control and flexibility in the mix. So in the case, for example, of the long plate reverb, I have the little plate by Sound Toys, 
and it is quite a long plate. It's over eight seconds of decay time. And in this case, I have bus 13 being sent to it. So I have these two guitars being sent to it. I don't believe there's too much else. So these two guitars are being sent to this single long plate reverb, and they are being sent pre fader rather than post fader. And so instead of inserting this little plate on both of these and having to set it up the same way, I have these two being sent to the long plate. And then additionally, I can also affect the reverb with EQ, flanging and gain in this particular case without affecting the original dry signal right here. So I hope that that makes sense, but setting up effects, sends and returns gives us so much more flexibility and control in our mix. And if you aren't doing it, I would highly recommend looking into it. So when I am in the stage of processing, there is a lot more that I would go through. I would try to get the mix sounding as good as possible with EQ, compression, saturation, delay, reverb, other effects like modulation effects, in this case, the flanger, for example, on the long plate, but also other effects. For example, you see here on the guitar whammy center, I have a little bit of transient shaping going on where I am drastically reducing the attack of the signal right there. In this case, I do have a stereo delay set on it, but by looking at this, this is more so for a sort of Haas effect where I'm just widening an otherwise mono signal rather than really giving it a specific delay. And if I scroll through, I don't think I have too much more. Oh, on the bass guitars right here, I have them being sent through the Dark Glass Ultra. This is an amp sim that I really like using. Now I could have sent this through it and then bounced this in place. But in this case, I had a MIDI bass bounced out to audio and I decided I would just run it through this in the mix and be able to have a little bit of control over the sound of the bass as I went through the mix by having this Dark Glass Ultra. So I didn't commit to an amp sound in this case. Normally I would, but that's just something else to add to this training. So again, I would go through and process my mix and rebalance with both my faders and with my effects as I would go through and try to get as good a static mix as I possibly could at the time of my mixing. Now, throughout this process, I'm going to be taking breaks, refreshing my ears, recalibrating my objectivity so that I can come back with a refreshed sense of what I want out of the mix. But I would spend a lot of time in this step both processing and reprocessing and refining the mix, again, to get a very strong static mix. And once we get a strong static mix, it's important to add some dynamics into the track. Of course, there's going to be a lot of dynamics in the way that it is played or programmed, depending on what kind of music you are working on. But additionally, we have the tool of automation to help us add more dynamics and more professionalism into our mixes. So if I open up the automation right here by clicking A in the case of Logic Pro. You don't see too much automation going on. Primarily, this has to do with the volume or the fader levels, and that is the bulk of automation that you will find is to do with moving fader levels around. Although in digital audio workstations, you can pretty much automate any parameter you want. But in this case, I took care of a lot of the dynamics within the tracks themselves, so I didn't feel the need to put in too much automation. But you can see here that I am automating the mono delay and the stereo delay to cut off at the very end. So all of a sudden they are muted effectively at just over halfway of the 67th bar here to end the song. And this really does bring us back to the additional control and flexibility that we have by setting up our effects returns to have our, in this case, delays on both the stereo and mono delay can be muted without having to deal with a bunch of different stereo and mono delays that have been inserted on our tracks. We just have these master stereo delay, master mono delay. We can mute them both without affecting any of the dry signals. Same thing goes right here for the long plate. You can see that I have the long plate at negative infinity right here, and then I have it coming up to negative 20.4. It starts at zero dB, but the tracks right here that are being sent to it only start playing right here at this negative infinity mark. So I could have this at any volume and it wouldn't make a difference. So I can drag that down to negative infinity if I'd like. Up here, going back to these guitars as the long plate is going up, these guitars are actually coming down. And because I have them set as pre-fader, the amount of audio being sent to this long plate reverb right here is independent of whatever the fader control says right here. So the amount that is actually being sent to the long plate 
remains the same, even though the output of these two tracks right here goes down and then the output of the long plate goes up. So we're basically trading off a dry signal for a wet signal over the course of this measure right here. Moving on, we have more intricate automation going on right here. You can see that the guitars are getting a little boost at each of their downstrokes. So every time there's a little break, I'm giving them just a little bit more juice right here. Now this is pretty monotonous to do in the mix, but I felt it was necessary just to give them a little bit more juice at the initial downstroke of whatever they're doing. And you can see the fader moving right there. Moving on, I have a little bit of automation on the overheads. I like to automate the overheads up a little bit on the downbeats of different sections. Oftentimes there is a crash going on, and so I want to sort of emphasize that crash a little bit. Moving on, I am automating a little bit of the embellishments on the hats. So for example, that And then in this section where there's a lot of hats going on, I actually have the volume down and then I come back up right here. Only about a 2 dB difference between the two sections, but just where there's a lot more going on. And because the hats are being picked up quite a bit by the overheads, I felt that in order to balance the hats a little bit better, I would just bring them down a little bit right here. The snares, once again, I have the VCA right here, so I can control the balance of the snares without altering the balance between the two tracks. Right here, I'm just bringing this up for the very end, the snare hit right here that goes into the second section. So I have zero dB right here. I'm bringing it up for this final hit and then into the second section, it's right back down to zero dB. And I don't actually have anything on the kick drums right there. So that is what I have for automation. Very simple, very basic fader automation in this track. I'm not doing anything too crazy and nothing with any other parameters. But for example sake, I could go and automate the input, the output, the attack, the release, the ratio, anything I want in the CLA 76. Or if I was to open up, say, the Saturn 2, I could automate any of these parameters to change throughout the entirety of the mix. So I would go through as the step four and do my automation to make the mix more exciting, more dynamic, have more of an impact on the end listener. And I would also go through and add any additional production effects that I thought that the mix might need, things like vocal throws or reverse cymbals or reverse snares or bass booms in certain genres of music, things to add a little bit more sonic interest and excitement to the mix. In this case, I took care of all of that during the actual production, and so I didn't actually have to go through and do anything like that within the context of the mix. So that is stage four, and stage five, of course, is mix finalization, and this is essentially where I will bounce the mix out, reference it on my own in places outside the studio. So for example, my car, on my earbuds, through my phone, on my home entertainment system, on my stereo system I have here inside my studio. Just to get a better idea of how the mix translates outside the studio, we will often spend so much time listening either on headphones or our studio monitors inside a nice treated space or a space that we're very familiar and comfortable with only to take it out into these other places and have the mix not sound quite how we imagined it to sound outside the studio. So it's important to do a few internal revisions on playback systems and environments that you're also somewhat familiar with, much like your car, for example, and make notes about things that could be changed and optimized in the mix. Come back in and do those revisions. Go back out, do this a few times to ensure that your mixes translate the way you want them to in your own systems and then send it off to the client. The client may or may not have revision notes. If they do, then it's important to address those professionally and to send back the best version of the song that you can according to those notes. And then once everybody's happy with the mix, we get to speak with the mastering engineer and make sure that we are sending off the appropriate formats and the appropriate levels in the mix so that we can get a better master and a better final product. Now, when sending mixes off to the client or even for referencing them on our own, it's important to maximize the loudness of our mix. And in that way, we get rid of the loudness bias when it comes time to reference our track against other tracks, especially those that have been professionally mastered and commercially released. So when we are sending it off to the client, we don't want our mix to be so much quieter than the other songs that they are comparing it against 
against that that becomes a big determining factor in their decisions and what they write back for for revisions and it also makes our lives easier when we are referencing our own mixes against our references outside the studio where level matching isn't necessarily as easy as it is inside the mixing session here so there are a few different ways of doing that. Primarily, we should try to focus on the mix and giving our mixes the potential for loudness. However, once it comes time to actually maximizing it, our primary tool for getting that loudness is limiting. In the case of this session and all of my other sessions, I like relying on the Pro L2 by FabFilter. This is an amazing brick wall limiter. It sounds pretty transparent and you can get nice loudness out of it without necessarily crushing the mix or really destroying the dynamics that we worked so hard on in the mix. But in addition to that, we also can use a little bit of clipping. It's not for the faint of heart and we really shouldn't be crushing it too much with clipping, but this just helps to control the stray peaks, especially before limiting so that the limiter doesn't have to work too hard. Again, I wouldn't go too far with clipping the mix bus, but if you know what you're doing, like many professional mixing engineers who clip their converters, you can get away with a little bit more loudness by clipping. Again, I'm not gonna go into super great detail about that in this video. I'm more so just focusing on the workflow, but that's another tool. And then another tool that I like to use in addition to the mix bus compression, which I would set up between the initial balance and the processing stages of my workflow, just so that I can mix into the mix bus compressor, is I like to set up a bit of saturation. This will not work on every mix, but saturation offers us a little bit of soft knee compression and harmonic generation. So it will help in some ways to increase the perceived loudness of a track or the luffs values. So in some instances where I need a little bit more character and a little bit more loudness, I will reach for a saturation plugin. In many cases, that is my go-to FabFilter Saturn 2 here. So again, I don't use saturation or clipping on every mix to get it loud, but I do rely on limiting just to bring the level up so that it is more competitive with the songs that I am referencing it against. Now there is metering here on the Pro L2 and there will be metering on whatever limiter you happen to be using if it's a good limiter. But I also have the Ulean loudness meter right here. This is the pro version, but there is also a free version if you're interested. And this just gives us a few more numbers that we can base our loudness decisions on. So we have integrated loudness in LUFS, that is loudness units full scale, which is essentially a measurement of the perceived loudness of a track before bouncing out my mix for revisions, either myself or for the client. I'll usually try for at least a negative 10 integrated luffs, although I won't always get there. And then when I'm actually mastering, I'll often aim for about negative eight. Although again, this is totally project dependent and not anything that I want to give strong numbers for. But that's effectively the basics of mix finalization, along with the basics of the other steps, mix preparation, the initial balance, processing and refining, and then automation and additional production effects. So as per usual, I've been going on for a little bit longer than I had hoped for. So let's wrap this up in Logic Pro. So I hope that this video has given you some ideas and some guidance on how to develop your own mixing workflow. Once again, my five step workflow is mix preparation, getting the initial balance, the bulk of my processing and refining such processing, automation and extra production techniques, and mix finalization. If you'd like more information on this workflow, once again, my mixing guidebook will be the first link in the description box down below. I'd highly recommend you picking that up. And if you'd like to spend more time with me here on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel, hit that like button, and check out one of these videos in the top left or top right corner for more information here. So click on one of these, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.